I wish I was dead. <laughs> yes, yes, from, from too much love of living, from hope and fear set free, we thank with brief thanksgiving, whatever gods may be, that no man lives forever, that dead men rise up never, that even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. Which is marvellous, isn't it? Yes, I love that. I do, I love that. I love it, sure. It's one of my favourites, you know. Yeah, Swinburne. Uh, Swinburne, yes, he knew his onions, that's Swinburne, yes. Yeah, so then... Anyway, we've got, we've got to have one more, have we, Mr Cooper? To have one more? Yes, rather, one more then. One more question then, please, on poetry. Question on poetry. Yes, go on. <laughs> go on, yes, go on. Y yes, now, th that's a very good question. Yes, <laughs> yes, very interesting, very well put. Yes, it's true. It's true, I'm not generally known by the general public uh, for poetry readings such as this. But then again, it's also true, isn't it, that the general public are not particularly au fait <laughs> with poetry, are they? I mean, poetry <laughs> is a language, if you like, a form of expression, <laughs> which has become largely otiose and <laughs> meaningless, meaningless to the man in the street. The reason being that words themselves no longer have the power and the beauty and the significance that they once had in, say, the Middle Ages, you know. In the beginning was the word, you see, which St. John's Gospel, of course, <laughs> Gospel according to St. John, yes, it's very true, and uh, it was very true, see, words were invented originally in order to house and represent our deepest, innermost feelings. So in the olden days, you see, if someone was leaving your house, you would always say to them, God be with you, wouldn't you? You'd say, God be with you, my dear. God be with you, you see. And you were bestowing a blessing on them. You were sending them away from your home, feeling blessed and sanctified with this God be with you, you see. Nowadays, people say goodbye, and they don't even know what it means. <laughs> mm, and it's a, it's a lovely line in Idiot, <clears throat> T.S. Idiot, when he says, we have only learned to get the better of words for the things we no longer have to say, or the way in which we are no longer inclined to say it. Which does sum it up, doesn't it, really? Doesn't it? Sums it all up, doesn't it? This whole question that we've been discussing here today of our relationship to faith and spirituality in a world where the rational is predominant and the needs of the soul are scarcely acknowledged. I mean, where are you supposed to look for moral guidance? in a world where you have thrown away your belief in an inner truth, outside of that which can be proved empirically in some laboratory, do you see? Do you see? <laughs> yes, and uh, of course it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a new thing. No. Oh no, it's not a new phenomenon. No, no, I mean really. You have to go back to the time of the Enlightenment. That was when the rot really set in because you had this debate going on, you see. There was this fantastic debate going on between Zwingli and Luther on the nature of the Eucharist the uh, second of the Lord's Supper, you see. And on the one hand, you had Luther, this great man of the Middle Ages, who fundamentally believed that the bread and the wine were the blood and the body of Christ. Not just mere symbols or pictures of the thought, but the thing itself, they were real. That, that they were symbols, but they were real. That's what made them so beautiful and ultimately so sacred, you see. Whereas, of course, on the other hand, you had Zwingli, very much steeped as he was in the thought of the Italian Renaissance, and he felt this was a barbarous absurdity. This idea that the bread and wine was real was a barbarous absurdity. <laughs> there, as far as he was concerned, mind you, having said that, he was at the vanguard of a whole new age, wasn't he? He was actually ushering in a new era of uncertainty and ambiguity, which is still with us today. We still live in this age of uncertainty, don't we? Modern man is constantly asking himself, "What am I here for? What is it all about?" You know. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's not. I, I, heard this, I heard this lovely story the other day, lovely story about T.S. Eliot. Apparently, T.S. Eliot's walking down Bloomsbury, you see, lovely story, and he got in the back of his cab, and this cab driver sitting up front looked at him in the driving mirror, and he said to him, uh, T.S. Eliot, isn't it? T.S. Eliot, 
Your thoughts are all that I'm all in my cab, mate. <laughs> all that I'm all in my cab, are you? Who do you think I had in my cab last week then, eh? Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell, the greatest philosopher in the Western world, so they say. Yeah, well, I asked him to yes. I did. I said to him, I said to him, I said, Bert, I said, Bert, what's it all about, mate? <laughs> and, and do you know the trick couldn't tell me? <laughs> yeah, he said, I mean, it's of course, lovely, I mean, lovely story. You always sit there laughing, of course you do. Say, you always sit there laugh, but it's true, it's a serious, serious point. Our modern age of science and rationality that we live in today is unable to answer these questions that we all of us have. We all of us have these questions, don't we? These fundamental questions about the very nature of our existence on Earth. What are we doing here? What is the point of this, our brief life here on Earth? You can't answer these sort of fundamental questions with science, can you? Or rationality? No! You have to say to yourself, were we not better off in the Middle Ages, when there was no such thing as doubt, before it had been invented? <laughs> you see, when man knew why he was here, knew what his purpose was on Earth, and knew what he was going to as well afterwards. I mean, you look at all our institutions. All our great institutions in this country are fundamentally based on this notion of a higher order ordained by God, aren't they? You look at the monarchy. You look at the disintegration of the monarchy since, well, since Charles I, who was the last king who actually believed that he was anointed by God. You see, it wasn't just a job. <laughs> yeah, oh yes, lucky is nowadays. Oh yes, you hear them, don't you? These people call themselves monarchists, saying, oh, it's such a marvellous job. Yes, old Liz. Oh yes, she's a very good job, doesn't she? Yes, very fine, yeah, very fine job. Very good, God bless her. God bless her, she's a very good job, doesn't she? I mean, they would have been beheaded in the olden days to say, wouldn't they? Off with his head. It wasn't a job in those days. It was a sacred duty, and everybody understood that. You see, everybody knew that if the king was happy, then everybody in the king done would be happy as well. It's a wonderful age of certainty, and because of that certainty, that that, that faith, it all followed through into these remarkable achievements you had in art and architecture. You know, you had these great cathedrals built, great cathedrals built for people to worship God in, and in a time before that, you had your pyramids and your stone thingy, stone thingy, inch. Einstone Inge and your Greek temples, all built to the glory of God. And what have we got nowadays? I ask you, what achievements have we got nowadays to compare with those great achievements of the past? I, I don't say space travel. <laughs> don't give me that rubbish about man on the moon. Man on the moon is a rubbish. A rubbish. I mean, if you care about poetry, you should stay away from the moon. Because once you put men on the moon, poetry is dead, isn't it? What's the moon to us now? It's just a lump of rock floating in the sky with men crawl all over it. That's all it is to us now, isn't it? Yes. Wait, some bloody money, all this space traveling. I've never, I've never been to the moon, have you? <laughs> no, I've never been asked. No, I've never been asked. <laughs> I've never been asked. No, I'll, I'll tell you something. I wouldn't go for what's asked either. Because what is the point in going up there to the moon when you leave behind a whole world full of people who are still basically unable to communicate with each other? You see, this is why we have all these wars, isn't it? All this violence, all these crime figures going through the roof and these drugs and these weapons of mass destruction hanging over our heads like the sword of Damocles. Ah, yes, no, yes, that's it. No, you see, that's it, isn't it, you see? That's it in a nutshell. Weapons of mass destruction. We have thrown away our spirituality and put all our faith in science and rationality and it has brought us to the age of the abyss. Uh, um... Yes, sir, very good question, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, very good question, yes, it's true, very true. I'm not generally known for poetry reading. <laughs> I think I've said enough, haven't I? Yes, thank you very much, thank you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr Cooper, yes, thank you. Oh, no, I enjoyed it. Yes, I did, you didn't tell me it was going to be a rowdy do. Oh, no, no, I did, no, I did, I enjoyed it, very, very enjoyable, yes. Makes it to change from the usual rubbish I'm asked to do, yes. Oh, yes, I've got it in my diary, June the 14th, the metaphysicals. Yes, I've brushed upon me, John Dunn. Very right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, I shall look forward to it, yes, thank you very much, goodbye. Yes, where's my mum? Where's my mum? Lou? Look here, Lou, come over here, girl. Come on, we're going home now. We're going home, get your coat on. Come on, girl, that's it, get your coat on, yes. Here, listen, mum, you've been a good girl, have you? Still got your knickers on, have you? <laughs> yes. We're going to walk home today. Yes, we'll walk home. Never mind, God help us. 
It's a lovely day. It's a beautiful day with the sun beating down. It's lovely. And we'll pop into Woolies on the way home and get battery for your, for your hearing aid. Come on. Here. Here, Lou. Come over here, girl. Come over here. Listen. Listen. Come here. Listen. You go upstairs. Put the kettle on. I'll be up in a minute. I'm just going over the road to have a word with those nabbies. Those bloody nabbies. Yes, I'm going to I'm going to work it out with them, I am. I'm going to sort it out once for all. I am. So up you go. Go on, up you go. Put the kettle on. Yes, use the lift. Use the lift. Well, wait for it. Use the lift. Yes. <laughs> use the lift. Go on. I'll be up in a minute. Go on. Go on. Yes, good girl. Here, you. Yes, you with the great drill. How dare you? <laughs> now, now, how bloody dare you? Listen, mate, you set that drill off at 7.30 in the morning, didn't you? I heard you. This is a residential area, you know. There are people living around here. How am I supposed to do my crossword puzzle first thing in the morning with that row going on? Not until you shook me out of my bed with that great drill of yours, dude. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, yeah. hello, hello, young man. I'm sorry I didn't see you down there. No, I was just talking to your colleague here. Your colleague. Him, that great fat fool with a drill, him, that, yes, him. It, no, 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 listen. I was, um, I was, um, just admiring your hole. Oh, yes, the lovely hole, I'm sure, yes, lovely hole. Mind you, yours is deeper than his. Look, he's only up to his knees. You're only up to your, up to your great chest, aren't you? Ooh. Here, listen, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. You shouldn't have your shirt off on a day like this, you know, with the sun beating down. Oh, what's your name? Tony. Tony, uh -huh. listen Tony, you shouldn't have it off on a day like this. Oh no! <laughs> oh no, you can go topless, you'll become inflamed. You will. It's very aging, very aging to the skin, you know. Oh yes, it's going to be like leather, it will. And those little shorts, oh, those little skimpy shorts you're wearing. Your thighs will be ablaze by sundown. <laughs> ablaze! <laughs> be. Abl I'm sorry? <laughs> what? Oh no, no, please no. No, no, please no, don't. Don't ask me, I couldn't. I couldn't do it here. What, in the street? Well, people would stare, wouldn't they, if I did it here? Uh, oh, well, <clears throat> that No, stop messing about. <laughs> no, 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 I don't like doing it, please don't. That's your lot, please don't ask me. I don't. You shut up. <laughs> Go play with the great tool. Go on, get of it. Mind your own business. Don't take any notes of him, Tony. Here, listen, by the way, Tony, I must tell you something, you know. You remind me so much of a boy I used to know when I was about 14 or 15, I would have been. He was one of my sister's boyfriends, he was. Dennis! That was his name. Dennis, he was just like you, he was. Yes, he had your same clumsy charm, you know. <laughs> yes, and that little chip in your front tooth, just the same. Just so, I shall never forget to see, because the doorbell rang. Bloody doorbell was always going, it was. And I went to the front door, you see, and I said, Oh, hello. You're Dennis, aren't you? Yes, I thought so. No, my sister's out. She's at one of her boyfriends. Mm. Oh, yes, she's got loads of boyfriends. Loads of them. Loads of them. You're not the only one, you know. Oh, no, not by long chalk. What, she stood you up? Has she? Oh, she's a fickle cow, isn't she? <laughs> no, she is. Were you going swimming? Go swimming, were you? I thought so. I saw your little towel under your arm. I thought, oh, he's going swimming. Lovely. Here, hang on a minute. Don't go away, Dennis. I've got a lovely surprise for you. Hold on, hold on. I'll come swimming with you. Yes. I'll... No, it's all right. I was stuck for something to do this afternoon. Anyway, I was bored, rigid, I was. Yes, come on, we'll go to Finsbury Bars. Come on. Sorry. Oh, come on, then. Oh, you're so big and muscly, aren't you? Oh, I bet you're a lovely swimmer. I don't know what my sister sees and all these other boys, you know. I think she only goes out with the ones with the most money. What do you do? What do you do? What's your job? You're a butcher boy? Oh, I should have guessed. You've got butcher boy written all over you, haven't you? You have, yes. I could never be a butcher boy, you know. Me? Oh, no, all that awful. A, a, <laughs> Chopping chickens' heads off, you must be joking. Mind you, you must, here, listen, you must get your hands on some lovely cuts, eh? Cuts, you know, cuts of meat, cuts of, you know, but nothing, steak, that's a rump steak for your mum. Yeah. Here, listen, Dennis, listen, if you want to get on the right side of my mum, do you know what she likes? 
My mother loves a bit of tongue. Oh! <laughs> what are you laughing at? What are you laughing at? There's nothing funny about that. She likes, likes a bit of tongue. Yeah, uh, yes, the nice tongue sandwich. Yes, she does. But me? Oh, no, I don't like tongue. No, 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 not at all. No, no. Meats, that's what I like. Here, yeah, come on, meats. I love it, meats, I do. Yes, I do. I love it. I love it. I love me meats. Oh, meats on toast. That's my favourite. Yeah. Here, wait, 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 Dennis, listen, listen, when, when we get to the pool, you will look after me, won't you? Because I had a dreadful thing happened to me last time I was at that pool. Oh, it was awful, it was dreadful. So I was just sitting there, you see. I was just sitting outside the pool, minding my own business, reading Rupert Brooke, and these great brutes, great brutes came up to me. They took the towel off my shoulders and threw it into the pool. Then they took me Rupert and threw him into the pool as well. And then they called me a fairy. A fairy. They started to scream blue murder to get the lifeguard over. And then, you see, now listen, then, you see, they, they follow me into the changing room and they got me down on the floor and they tried to pull my trunks off. I did not enjoy it. How could you say such a thing? I was humiliated. Wait, wait Dennis, wait. Wait, you listen. Listen, Dennis, listen. Here, when we get to the pool, please, please, wait, can I say you my big brother? I'll say you my big brother and I'll say you lick them. I'll say you lick them. Yeah, you will eat them, won't you? You will eat, you will eat, yeah, thank you very much, thank you, yeah. <laughs> Look, would you please stop going on about my bloody sister? Sick of hearing about her. I've told you she's fickle. You'll never get a ring on her finger, mate. Oh, no, you'd be better off putting a ring for her nose. That's the only way you'll lead her down the aisle. <laughs> shut, shut your mouth. I'll see her in action on all she's like. She's got half the boys in our street sniffing around the front door, she is. You get sick to death of bloody doorbell going all the time. Day and night. Oh, no, 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 I don't mind you. Oh, no, no, you're all right. <coughs> yes, because you're refined, aren't you? Yes, you are. Here, listen, have you ever, um, have you ever, uh, you know, with her? <laughs> kissed her, have you ever kissed her? <laughs> well, she's my sister, it is my business, come on. No, if you ain't, no, I didn't think so. No, no, because you're refined. Maybe she won't let you. Oh, you're joking. She won't let you kiss her. Oh, you're joking. You're joking. It's a disgrace. It really is. No, it's outrageous. I'd let you. Yes, of course I would. I'd let you. What's wrong with that? You kiss your mum, don't you? You kiss your mum? Well, there's nothing dirty about that, is there? Well, they don't some bloody stupid great ignoramus. Honestly, I've never heard such a lot of rot in all that. Oh, Dennis! Dennis, don't go! Don't go! Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know I talk too much, but you see, I always get nervous when I'm going swimming. I always chatter when I'm nervous, but I won't say another word. I promise. Come on. Here, yeah, listen, I'll tell you what, I'll recite some poetry for you. Yes, that's what I'll do. I'll recite some poetry. I can. I got highly commended for this at school last week. My teacher was in floods of tears, she was. You know, just shout at me. I mean, just be quiet. Just be quiet. And just stand there and listen. Honestly, I promise you'll love it. You'll read. Oh, you will. Just hold on. Hold on. Listen, listen. On either side the river lie, on fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wall and touch the sky, and through the field the road runs by to many towered Camelot. And up and down the people go, gazing where the lilies blow, round the island there below. The island... Here, Dennis, don't go. It's a good bit coming up now. Hold on. Don't wander off. It's getting really good now. There's a really juicy bit coming up now. Oh, you'll love this next bit. You will, I promise you. Just, just... Hold on. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, little breezes dusk and shiver through the wave that runs forever. I'm just getting to it. Hold on. Oh, Willis White, Nesbitt Squiver, Little Breezy Dusk and Shiver, Through the Wave runs forever, By the Island, In the River, Flowing Down to Camelot, That's it, Four Grey Walls, And Four Grey Towers, Overlook a Space of Flowers, And the Silent Isle Embowers, The Lady of... Go on, Alan, go on, bugger off, you great moron! Go on, Alan, go on! <laughs> no wonder you can't get a girlfriend, you stupid archer, you great ignoramus! So off! Dennis! 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 Oh. 
All too soon we had to part The moment you had touched my heart And with you went my dream All too soon All too sweet was our affair and you put all the sweetness there Oh, a shame that it's gone <laughs> All too soon I knew the great a delight That only you and love can bring but when I reached, reached the height, I realized the bottom fell from everything. You should know, as well as I, our love deserves another try. For you whispered goodbye. All too soon All too bloody soon I should have realised Pearls before swine, that's what he was You didn't even understand poetry Oh no, he had no taste at all for the finer things in life And I am one of the finer things in life, I am Oh yes, no doubt about it, yes Besides, he had bad breath. <laughs> if there's one thing I can't abide by fellow human beings, it is halitosis. Or B.O. Bugger off, that's what it stands for in Marvel, yes. B.O. Bugger off. Don't go to me with the sweaty old pigs, mate. There are products in the market, you know. No excuse for this day age, you know. I mean, I'm not trying to say I'm not disappointed. Of course I am. I'm only human. I'm wounded! But you'll regret it. Oh yes, you'll regret it all right. One day you'll be walking past that theatre and you'll see me name up there in lights. And you'll say to himself, oh, we could all have been so different if only I hadn't been such a stupid, great, ignorant, foul, breath, sweaty, arm-pitting twit. Oh, you should know, as well as I, our love dissolves another try. Oh, you whisper goodbye. Well, you blue didn't you? Go on, back off out of it. Good rinse of bad rubbish. <coughs> Here. No. Come, Mum, come out of there. Come on, listen, Lou, I've told you before, if you want to go, go and use your own. So let me cross the hallway. I can't have one rule for you and another rule for everybody else. If they all know you're using it, they'll all be wanting to piss and shit in it, won't they? They have no privacy at all, really, there's nothing sacred. I'm not shouting. I'm not shouting, I'm just saying you know the rules. Look, Mum, just go home. Go on, you're making me tired. Go on, I'll come see you later. Go on, go on. Now, I've told you I'm going out for dinner tonight. Russell and Jeremy and some friend of Jeremy's. You wouldn't enjoy it. Sure, I won't. All right, we'll just, just go home then if you don't like it. Go on. I'll look, Lou, I promise you, I will come and see you later. But I'll pass it in. When I come in from dinner, I'll come and knock on your door, right? I will. I'll come and knock... All right, then I won't bother! I need to slam the door. Here we go again. Off on the old roller coaster ride to hell. I'll never learn, will I? Bawling and shouting in the street. Getting pissed. Making a pathetic exhibition of myself. The only thing I have learnt that I'll never learn. Oh God, where is the sign I've been begging you for? The sign that my life has not been completely worthless. I've squandered it, I know, I've, I've thrown it away. 
on meaningless shit. I've done things they wouldn't ask an animal to do. And what for? Bit of respect. Oh no, all I'll be getting is nudges and winks in the street. Like, cretins come up to me, pouring at me. The sickening familiarity, you just want to go home and scrub yourself with carbolic. And when I do come home, there's no peace. Even here, there's no bloody peace I've got her. I know she doesn't mean any harm, but there's just no end to it. Where are the arms I've begged you for? Night after night I've begged you for strong arms to enfold me and make me feel safe from the horrors of this world. I've never been loved. Oh no. Oh no, I've never been loved. Never been loved, have I? Oh no, I just want to die now. What have I got to look forward to at my age, eh? At least I'd be released from me pain, wouldn't I? Oh, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. Yes. Yes, that's what I'll do. Yes, I'll, I'll kill myself. Yes, I'll kill myself. That'll show them, won't it? Oh, yes, that'll show them. They'll wish they treated me a bit better, won't they, when I'm dead and gone? Yes, I'll be up there on the cloud, I will, looking down at my funeral, and I'll be saying to them, you should have treated me a bit better, shouldn't you? I'd still be here, wouldn't I? Go on, cry your fucking crocodile tears. Still like your tears, because I'm dead, do you? I'm dead, and I'm glad. I'm glad I'm dead. I've got away from you, love, and I? Yeah, bugger. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. I said, Kenneth, please stop that awful shouting. Horrible. It goes right through my head when you do that. Please don't. Listen, come here, Kenneth. No, come here. I want a word with you. Just sit down. Just sit down. Come on. Now, just calm down. Listen, Kenneth, you have got damn all to complain about. So listen, listen. All this whinging on about your career. You've had a wonderful career. You've had a career most actors would give their right arms for. I would. You're a star of stage, screen and radio, for God's sake. You go on a chat show, and as soon as you open your mouth, people fall about laughing, their, their faces light up when they see you because they love you. You're loved, Kenneth, by a whole nation. What more do you want? And all this whinging on about, I've never had a lover, no one's ever loved me, never had a lover. I'm sorry, it's just bullshit, isn't it? Isn't it? You know it is, because you've had loads of opportunities, haven't you? <coughs> loads of them. You've had, you, you've had them queuing up. Men and women throwing themselves at you. What do you do? Every single time you do the same thing. You find some little tiny defect in them, you blow it up out of all proportion, and then you push them away. Every time. Well, that's fine if you want to be by yourself. That's all right. You can do whatever you like. But please don't sit there titting on about how you've never been loved. It's just bullshit. I mean, we've all had problems. All of us. We all have days when we feel defeated and unloved and unlovable and we can't see the way ahead and we think, oh, what's the point in going on? Might as well just end it all now. It's too difficult. Of course we do. But we do go on. We do because you've only got one life, Kenneth. You're not going to get another go. This is it. This is your chance. Just make the most of it. Enjoy it. It's not that bad. You're not going to be up on some cloud looking down at us and laughing. You'll be dead. Gone. Forever. That'll be it. I'm sorry. All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to shout, but I just wish you could understand that we love you for who you are. We don't want you to... Kenneth! <coughs> Kenneth! He'll be... He'll be back, I promise you. But I'm sorry. I just get sick of all this whinging about how hard done by he is. You know, I mean, we all have problems, don't we? Of course. Of course we do. How do you know you're alive unless you've got problems? But you sort them out, you sit down, and you work your way through them. You have to. I mean, I think some people enjoy having problems. You know, they like whinging, some people. And I have a right to talk to Kenneth in that way, because, you see, I have a link with Kenneth Williams. Tenuous, perhaps, but a link. You see, when I was a lad, about 11, 12, that sort of age, about 11 or 12, I used to spend a lot of time alone. 
in my bedroom with the door locked, imagining that I was other people. Funny people, always funny people who I'd seen on television. Because, you see, I felt that people who were funny had cracked it. They got it, the secret of survival. I discovered, probably the only useful thing I learned at school, really, was that if you can make people laugh, eventually they will stop hitting you. <laughs> they will. Honestly, they will. Then, you only have to worry about the ones with no sense of humour. They're the dangerous <laughs> ones. Stay away from them, all right? So, you see, I'd be up there in my bedroom when I was about, um, this is about 11, 11 or 12, and I would be Eric Morecambe. Never any wise. Oh, no. <laughs> Never him. But I'd be, I'd be Eric Morecambe. Oh, yes. And uh, I'd be, uh, I'd be um, Will Hay. I'd be Jack Benny. He was easy. All you had to do with him was just go, hmm. That's all you had to do for Jack Benny is go, hmm. <laughs> and I'd be uh, Groucho Marx. I'd be Harpo Marx. And I'd be the entire cast of Dad's Army. When I was 11, I used to go to school thinking I was Sergeant Wilson. I did. Honestly, I'd be saying, oh, I'd say, what, what, an, what, what an awfully good human. Very lovely. Very, what an awfully attractive human. Very lovely, very charming. <laughs> Wilson. 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 What are you doing, Wilson? There's a war on, you know. A, I'm, I'm, I'm quite aware of that, Captain Manry. Uncle Arthur. Uncle, Uncle Arthur, if you don't let me use the Tommy gun, I'm going to tell Mum. But, oh, do be quiet, Frank, please, really. Really. <laughs> really, Frank, please. Get Wilson. Get Wilson. You, you ought to do something about that boy, you know. He's turning into a bit of a Nancy boy. Captain <laughs> <laughs> <get> Manley. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if I might be excused. One of my sister Dolly's upside down, Kate. <laughs> just, just, just disagreed with me. Oh, no, 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 Godfrey, don't be absurd. There's a war on. Do it in your mess hat. The Reverend. Oh, you don't know, Manwin. He's reverence, he's very upset. Oh, he's reverence. He's reverence. He's reverence, he's very upset. Oh, you don't know, he's re Oh, do be quiet, Mr. Yateman, you silly little bad. <laughs> you think so? You all right here. No. They used to clap in those days. He used to say, oh, shut up. He's a change. No, but the person I wanted to be, more than anybody else, I wanted to be Spike. Milligan, see? But no, no, a lot of people don't like him, do they? Do they? A lot of people, a lot of people don't get the point of him, do they? Do you like him? That man in the nice yellow tie. Do you like Spike Milligan? I don't very much. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought I was picking up anti-Milligan vibes from you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, you can be mistaken. I thought, oh, he doesn't like the type, does he? You know. But you know, well, so a lot of people, there'll be people behind you who sort of hate him. Well, there's always, there's always people who don't get the point of him, aren't there? That's all right, though. You don't have to like everybody. But you see, the thing is, when I was 12, I thought the Goon Show was the funniest thing I'd ever heard in my life. I had all these old Goon Show records and script books, a big pile of them, you see. And I thought, if I could write something as funny as that, somehow all my troubles would be over, you see. That's what I thought. So I had to sit in my bedroom with the door locked, writing screeds of Milligan-esque material. Everything I wrote was in the style of Spike Milligan, including my chemistry homework. Everything. <laughs> All of it. My teachers used to take me aside at school, you see, and they'd say, uh, David. This was in Birmingham, by the way. <laughs> so, David, we very much enjoy marking your homework. We do, we look forward to receiving it. We pass it around amongst our friends. You know, which I thought, I thought was wonderful, you know. But they said, every time you allow extraneous material to enter your work, your mark will plummet. Now, you see, all my work was extraneous material. I, I didn't deal in facts. Didn't, didn't have any facts to offer them. I thought this made them laugh. Surely that's enough. You know, what more do they want? I should get top marks. But anyway, they, they didn't see it that way. Never mind. Never mind, because my time came at last, in 1975, when I was 13 years old. Figure it out for yourself, dear. <laughs> 36, oh, oh no, don't, oh no, don't, no, no. Oh no, no, don't, no, listen, listen, no. Oh no, don't, no, don't, no, listen. No, listen, listen, you see, no. What? No, 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 oh no, 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 listen, no. No, shut up, no. <laughs> oh no. Hang on, wait, that's Frankie Howard, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> right, okay, sorry. 
No, no, listen. No. Get, get off! Go on, get off! Go on, get off! Get off! Maybe next show. All right, we'll see. Don't, don't encourage him, please. Thing is, right, now, the BBC. BBC had this competition. Every year they had this thing called the Jack and Ori Story Writing Competition. Remember that? You were invited to uh, write a little story and send it in. I thought, well, this is it. I thought, this is the opportunity I've been waiting for. So I, I sat in my bedroom, locked the door, and I wrote this story called The Rag and Bone Man. <coughs> right, it's in your programmes. You can read it later. You did buy programmes, didn't you? <laughs> did you? Did you buy programmes? There's always a few stingy sods, aren't there? <laughs> always a few stingy sods who turn their noses up at the programme, aren't they? Well, I'll tell you what. If you're a good audience, and uh, you walk, well, you lot warm up a bit. You lot calm down, right? <laughs> <laughs> Try and even up, you know, try and even up. If you're good, if you're a very good audience, you're well behaved, then maybe we'll sell some later. All right. <laughs> if you're good, we'll see. And you'll be able to go home and read in your programmes that I wrote this story, The Rag and Bone Man, in my best Milligan style. I even heard Spike Milligan reading it in my head. Or Peter Sellers. Or Harry Seacombe at Pinch would have been all right as well. And I was mortified when I got this letter from... Uh, the producer of Jack and Ori, Daphne Jones, and she said, congratulations, your story has been selected as one of the winners and will be read on Wednesday the 10th of December, 1975, by Kenneth Williams. <laughs> and I thought, Kenneth Williams? <laughs> Kenneth bloody... I've never wanted to be Kenneth Williams. I never impersonated him at school because he was so camp. You know, he was so camp. <laughs> I mean, you can't go camping it up at school, can you? <laughs> can you? I mean, you'll bring ignominy upon yourself. There's no greater disgrace than to be camp at school. So I thought, God, Kenneth Williams. I thought, oh, well, it'll have to do. <laughs> now, <laughs> no, wait. Listen, listen. How, you're probably asking yourselves at this point, how did he come to be this prodigiously talented child sitting in his bedroom writing all this award-winning material? Uh, you are asking yourselves, aren't you? <laughs> are you? Right, well, I'm going to tell you anyway. I'm going to tell you. It was because of my mother, you see. I can trace it all back, as we all can, all of us. You can trace it all back, can't you, ultimately, to your mother. And my mother's a loony. <laughs> no, she's balmy, my mother. Off a rocker, woofing. She is woofing, my mother. Mind you, a lot of people have balmy mothers, don't they? Have you noticed? You ask anyone, how's your mother? They say, oh, she's off a rocker, don't they? <laughs> What's that all about? Isn't that strange? How, how many people, show of hands, how many people here have got a balmy mother? Go on, how many people? Put your hands up, how many, come on. Wait, one there, yes, one there, one down here, a few down here, go on, how many more? There's one over there, yes, oh yes, it's good. A forest of hands, oh, keen. Keen as mustard over there, you there, put your hand up again. Yes, young lady there. Yes, you. Have you got a balmy mother? I think we're all quite intrigued now, aren't we? <laughs> Have you? Why is she barming? What's she do? How does your mother's barminess manifest itself? She, she's elderly and she forgets. <laughs> Are you calling her barmy? She's just an old woman. She's just an innocent old woman. You leave her alone. You leave her. Nothing wrong with you. Don't come to my show and complain about your elderly mother. Nothing wrong with her. Is that your barmy mother there, is it? Is it? Is it? I thought so. She put a hand on her mother sitting next to her down here. <laughs> is she barmy? Yeah. Is she? Yeah. <laughs> what does she do? She what? She's just herself. She's just herself. <laughs> ah. Ah, it's quite sweet, really. She takes you to the theatre, doesn't she? West End shows. That's what my mother used. didn't used to do things like that with me. She didn't tell me to West End show. She used to say very strange things to me, my mother. She used to say things like, all right, here's me when I'm five. She said, David, I've been talking to God. God says you become a priest or you become a brain surgeon. But if you become a brain surgeon, I get cancer and die a horrible death at 72. I don't want to die, thank you very much. I want to live. <laughs> I want to live to a ripe old age and I want all my kids to live until they're 120. So don't you try and kill me. And she just hit me, you see. <laughs> Honestly, and this started when I was about five years old. She was fine up until that point. Fine. <laughs> Then she just suddenly flipped. She became telepathic for a start. Honestly, she could read our thoughts. I remember when I was five years old, I was sitting there at the breakfast table and she read my thoughts. She read that I was 
I don't know, trying to come between her and my father or something. So she picked up a fork and she threw it at me. And it bounced off my forehead, leaving four tiny cuts just there. Just there. Of course, I cried. And my father sent us all out the room. He said, go on, out you go. Go on, out, out, go to your room. And they had it out in the breakfast room, the pair of them. And I remember I went and I opened the, the breakfast room door and I peeped in. And he was holding her wrists above his head like this. And he was saying, why did you do that? You could have blinded him for life. Why did you do He's only five. Why did you do that? And she was saying, he, he was trying to kill me. Yes, he was. Let me go. He was trying to kill me. I'm telling you, he was. And she saw me and she said, David, come and help me. Come on. Come on, come and help me. Come on. And my father turned around. He said, go to your room. Go on. I've told you before. Go to your room. Stay there. And I did stay there for the next 10 years, really, <laughs> till I was 15, when one... I think it was a Wednesday afternoon. It was a Wednesday afternoon. They, they came to take her away. But anyway, on the day of the big broadcast, the big day arrived at last, Wednesday the 10th of December, 1975, we had our morning assembly. As we always did every day, 9am every morning, with our beloved Mr Brindley. Mr Brindley, now I'd like you all to help me at this point, if you would. Okay? I'd like, well, you don't have to, but you'll enjoy it more if you do, I promise you. I'd like you, <coughs> like you all to do a bit of acting, right? A sort of a group improvisation, okay? Now, I can feel sphincters tightening all over the theatre. <laughs> it's nothing. It's nothing, honestly, I promise you, it's nothing. It's nothing. All you have to do is sit there and imagine that you're 13 years old, right? Well, do your best, dear. Anyway, do your best. <laughs> Pass your mind back through the mists of time. So when you were 13, right? In fact, I want you to imagine your 13-year-old brummies. Okay? Yeah, it's like method acting, right? So, we'll have a quick rehearsal. We're going to rehearse saying, Good morning, Mr. Brindley, in a Birmingham, in a Birmingham accent. Like this. Wait, 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 wait. Good morning, Mr. Brindley. Good morning, Mr. Brindley. Very good. Excellent. Oh, <laughs> send shivers down my spine. Like Lovely. Right, good, excellent. Okay, now I must say, must say, first of all, don't mind these cameras. Have you noticed there's cameras here? And I've got this thing on here, this mic. Just because we got to this stage of the, the run. I've been doing this show for about a year and a half, you know. I said, well, I don't have a video. So I found these guys, they work cheap, you know. <laughs> I thought they'll do, you know. It's all coming out of my pocket, I have to say. But you're gonna, you could find yourselves, one of them in about ten years' time, late night, Channel 5, about five in the morning. <laughs> you know. When they get really desperate, they might put this on, you never know. So, this is a chance. Think of this as an audition, okay? So, you're 13, you're 13 years old, you're sitting there in a freezing cold assembly hall on a grey, drizzly December morning, 9am, in Birmingham. Good morning, middle school. Good morning, I said good morning, middle school! Right. Right, we're going to start this morning with hymn number 72. Launched in the book, just quickly as possible. Come on. Hymn number... S <laughs> you. <laughs> you Why am I looking at you? Why am I looking at you? Are you chewing? <laughs> Are you chewing? Open your mouth! Open your mouth! Wide! Right, glass monitor, Inspector Mel. <laughs> you all know the rules about chewing in school. How many times you have to be told? Gain and again and again. You have to be told, don't you? <laughs> yes, I thought so. Right, you're in detention. See me afterwards. I'm surprised at you. You've got long hair. The number of times I've had to snip bubblegum out of little girl's hair in my office. <laughs> I'm not laughing. <laughs> See me afterwards. You're in detention. Thank you, Mr. Oper.
Am I the only one singing this evening? <laughs> because I sometimes think so. Now, come on! You not see one of your pop songs now, young lady. You sing it to the glory of God. Let's hear it. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. <laughs> mean it. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll all be coming back at four o'clock and you'll sing it again. And again. And again. <laughs> Till you don't sing it properly. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rapper. <laughs> Back here at four o'clock, over the last one of you. <laughs> Quiet! Stop your ablalaboo. Stop your cup cup on you. Let us pray. <laughs> oh Lord. We ask thine to look down on us this day, for we have sinned mightily in thy eyes. Teach us to respect our elders and betters, and to remember that rules were made for a reason and not for fun. <laughs> for Christ's sake! <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now then, we got a couple of notices this morning. <coughs> Some very sad news. Mrs. Tadman Smith is very, very poorly. <laughs> you laughed. <laughs> very well, you will all make get well cards for her <laughs> in your own time. And you'll leave them in my office by break tomorrow. Anybody who fails to do so will be in detention. Ah, oh, now that we've got some good news at last. One young lad in this school has done something of which we can all be very, very proud. David, what's your name? Benson. David Benson of Class 3, nothing. Where is he? Here, stand up, lad, come on, stand up. Let's all have a look at him. Has written a story. The Rag and Bone Man. This story will be read at 4 o'clock this afternoon on Jack and <laughs> By Kenneth Williams. Now, I think that is something in which we can all take very great pride, and I wish one or two other boys and girls in this school would do something like that that we could be proud of instead of bringing this school into district. Don't! <laughs> and I hope that each and every last one of us in this school will go up to David in the course of our day in school today and say thank you very much indeed, David. Thank you for putting Parkour Comprehensive on the map. Let's give him a round of applause, shall we? Right, class monitors, I want the names of every individual in your class who thought it was clever and funny not to clap. <coughs> you'll come to my office at break time and you will apologise personally to poor David. And you will stand on the rounders pitch for your entire lunch hour, clapping until you understand the meaning of gratitude. <laughs> yes, miss. Gone, aren't you? Root. Root. Mind you, I must tell you something. Very quickly, because you've warmed up a bit there at the back now, haven't you? You've warmed up, see. See, I can unburden myself to you now. I can tell you things I wouldn't tell another <coughs> audience. And I'm going to tell you this. I, um, I've been doing this show, as I say, quite a long time. And about, uh, about uh, Chris, it was Christmas 96, I did the show in Birmingham. You see. No, you didn't come and see it, if that's what you're thinking. <laughs> but I did go back to my old school, Parkour Comprehensive. I wanted to. I just fancied to look round, you know, for old times' sake. So I went along, I gave him a ring, and I was given a tour of the entire school by this man called Mr. North, deputy headmaster. Very nice man. And he told me that um, apparently Mr. Brindley had an ethos about the morning assembly. You see, he didn't believe in all this modern progressive rubbish about dropping the hymns and the, the prayers, you know, secularising it. Oh, no. Or involving the kids and allowing them to 
talk about issues that interest them and give them a good positive start to their day in school. Oh, no. No, no, he said, no, he said, what they want is an hymn, a prayer, and a bollocking. That's what they want. <laughs> That's an hymn, a prayer, and a bollocking. That's what he said. That was his ethos. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, it, it makes it all explicable somehow, doesn't it? If only you'd known that when you are at school, it'd be so much easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> anyway, the next day, after my story being read on television, you see, I, I, uh, I went back to school, of course, as usual, as I always did. And was I hailed as a conquering hero? No. Of course I wasn't. Everywhere I went, I had these great yobs coming up to me and going, Jack and Nori, Jack and Nori, all through the lunch hour, Jack and Nori, Jack and Nori, all through the football lesson. Jack, even the football teacher was doing it eventually. I began to wish I'd never heard of the bloody programme, and I cursed the name of Kenneth Williams. Actually, wait a minute, that's right, it was a Wednesday afternoon when they came to take her away, because we had football on a Wednesday afternoon. This is when I was 15, you had a choice, in fact. You could either play football, or you could go to the library to revise for your forthcoming O-levels. Now, I used to, I used to, um, I used to go home to sneak home, you see. I would have played football, but you see, I was terrified of it. Not the football, it was the showers. <laughs> That's what terrified me, you see, because for some reason, I, um, I went through puberty about eight months before the rest of my classmates, you see. And don't ask me why, but I was just so embarrassed. I used to keep my towel tightly clamped around me in the changing room till the last possible moment to hide all this terrible evidence, you know, these great <laughs> protuberances and fur, all this terrible fur, you know. And of course, they'd all be going, what's he got to hide? Let's see. What's he got to hide? Let's have a look. Come on. Let's have a look. But eventually they all caught up with me. They all, you know, as we all do, everybody has to go through it eventually, don't we? Even in Birmingham. Of course. <laughs> like, and so did they, like a garden of rose bushes. One by one, they all came in to bloom, you see. <laughs> And that was when I started to enjoy myself. The towel came off. I thought, yeah, here we go. I used to look forward to Wednesday afternoons after that. You know, rolling around in the mud with all the lads. Then you'd have a nice hot shower together afterwards. Mind you, that was the thing. I had to be very careful of these showers. Because, you see, I, I, uh, I started to enjoy the showers a bit too much towards the end. You know, you don't have much control over your body when you're that age, do you? I've got much control over it now, to be honest. But anyway, you see, we, got, we had this teacher, this... Uh, Mr. Baberstock, he was a football teacher, right? He used to make us line up in the changing room, you see, while the water heated up for the showers, naked. Naked. Well, we were naked, Mr. Baberstock wasn't. <laughs> More's the pity. Was it, ooh, ooh. 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 No, he was, he, 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 was, uh, he was a dead ringer for Kevin Keegan. <laughs> Of course, it was every schoolboy's dream to play with Kevin Keegan, wasn't it? <laughs> what? Well, it was mine, anyway. Still wouldn't mind, actually. Anyway, you see, we'd... Um, right, we'd all be stood there in this, in this naked, quivering line, you see, in the changing room. You'd have a naked boy here, you see, and uh, be another one there. Are you cold? Breathing. Really cold. Are you cold? Are you cold? <laughs> Oof! <laughs> Get off. Get off. Mm. And, um, <laughs> Mr. Baberstock would be stood there with his hand on the stopcock, and he'd say, come on, lads, come on! And all these latecomers, all the little naked stragglers, would come hopping along, and they'd all join the end of this queue, and you'd all gradually get bunched up like this, and go, oh, 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 oh. And the hot water was rushing and the steam was billowing. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Babasov, you say, right, lads, in you go. And you all go piling in there together and go sliding around amongst all these soapy, naked bodies. <laughs> those were the days. <laughs> uh, best days of your life, aren't they, when you think about it? But you know, something very peculiar happened. Very strange. Once we all hit puberty, you see, and we all had the <coughs> fur, you know, the dangly bits, they just stopped the showers. They phased them out. They used to go home muddy. Honestly, I think, they th I think they thought, the powers that be, thought, must have thought that something unnatural might happen in the showers, all these hormones flying around, you see. So they just, they just phased them out. And I thought, well, I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry, if we're not having showers, I'm not playing football. Sorry. Sorry. So I used to go home. 
Now, this particular Wednesday afternoon, I went in through the, <laughs> through the back door, into the breakfast room at the back of the house, and, you know, through the, and there, lurking in the shadows, as usual, thinking her dark thoughts, was my mother. And she said, what are you doing here, David? You're not supposed to be here, you're supposed to be at school. You'll never get to the top if you play truant. I said, play truant? I said, oh, fuck off, I went to bed. <laughs> don't, no, you have to understand, don't look at me like that. She's looking at me askance. Don't look at me askance. You have to understand, we hated her by this time. The whole family, even the dog hated her. <laughs> My father had divorced her and she wouldn't leave the house. <laughs> she, was, she was always going, honestly, she was going, always going on about these conversations she'd been having with people on television, telepathic conversations with like Richard Baker, Cilla Black, Cliff, that was the worst. <laughs> she had a hotline to Cliff Richard, you know. I think, I think they used to discuss God a lot because God played a very big part in all my mother's adventures. I remember on one occasion, she became obsessed with the conductor of the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. So, not Simon Rattle. No. Not Sir Simon. No, no, the one before <coughs> Sir Simon. Anybody know? Yes, who said that? Don't say it again. Louis yes, round of applause for this man, darling. Yes. <laughs> I don't, oh, what's the matter with him? <laughs> must be allergic. Must be allergic to Louis Fremo or something. How strange. That's right. Are you from Birmingham? Yes. Ah, well, there you are. That's right. Aha, you see. But he was very, dis very distinguished, wasn't he? French. You know, French. Very uh, uh, august. Long hair. Long hair down here. Louis Fremo. Although, of course, in Birmingham, we used to call him Louis Fremo. <laughs> That's what he was called in Birmingham. Louis Fremo. He used to answer to it after a while. They'd say, Louis Fremo. You go, we. But anyway, I was, no, I, I was imagining, like, I have this mental picture of him, right, standing on the podium at Birmingham Town Hall, conducting Beethoven's Fifth or something, da 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 da, da da da, and somewhere behind him in the audience sits my mother, with her eyes boring into the back of his head, deep in telepathic conversation. You're trying to kill me, Louis Fremo. You're trying to murder me. You're trying to rape me through music. You rape me through music, die a horrible death of cancer at 72. Something, something along those lines, you know. And one day, my father had a phone call from Louis Fremo. I got my dad, and he said, hello? He said, hello, this is Louis Fremo here. I, Louis Fremo. And very upset. Uh, there's a woman who's been pestering me for weeks. She says she's your wife. She says God has told her she must have a relationship with me. Mm. <laughs> she follows me around wherever I go. Even now she is sitting outside my apartment refusing to leave. Please, I'm a very busy man. Could you tell me what I should do? My father said, well, I'm a very busy man as, as well. I'm a doctor. I suggest you dial 999. I mean, we wanted her dead. We did. We used to sit around discussing how we could kill her. You know, it's the only way we could think of to be free of her. Not that we ever would. We wouldn't have actually have done it, murdered my mother. But somehow, somehow talking about it together as a family, you know. <laughs> you know, it gave us hope, you see. It gave us hope. So there I was, I was lying in my bed, it was about half past two in the afternoon, it was when, this Wednesday afternoon, I was lying in my bed, fast asleep. I suddenly woke up with a start, because I heard my father's car pulling into the driveway below my bedroom window. Oh, that's strange. He's not supposed to be here, he's supposed to be looking at pregnant women. Because he has an antenatal clinic on a Wednesday afternoon, you see, he never, doesn't come home on a Wednesday. But there was his car. And he came into the house, like I... I tiptoed over to my bedroom door and I put my ear up against the door and I listened and I could hear him downstairs talking to her in a calm, reasoning sort of voice. So I knew there was something wrong. <laughs> and she said, don't be so silly, there's nothing wrong with me, I'm perfectly all right. I'm very much in love with you, silly, very happily married, thank you. And then another car pulled into the driveway next to my dad's. And I heard the doors open and close, one, two, three, four of them. And these voices came into the house. And I was stood there at my bedroom door, listening. My heart was beating. I thought, something's up here. What's going on? And I couldn't hear what they were saying to her downstairs. But I could hear her. She was saying, she was saying, get out of my house. I don't want you here. This is my house. I say who comes and goes. Leave me alone. Leave me alone! And then there was this almighty great crash, and she came thundering up the stairs like a rhinoceros. The whole house shook. I leapt away from my bedroom door because I thought she might try and take refuge in my bedroom. There's a lock on the door, you see. I this lock. But she didn't. She ran past my bedroom door, thank God, into the bathroom, slammed the door shut, and rattled the lock after her. And then the voices started to come up the stairs. And they went past my bedroom door, 
muttering. I could hear them muttering as they went by. And they hovered outside the bathroom. And one of the voices said, right, come on, open the door. We don't want any trouble. Come on, open the door. And she said, go away, leave me alone. I'm having a bath. <laughs> and then a woman's voice piped up. And she said, I'll try. Barbara. Come on, Barbara. You're going to be a good girl and open the door now. Barbara. Come on, Barbara. We're not going to hurt you. We're your friends. Barbara, come on, open the door. And she said, drop dead. And then there was this noise. This, 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 it was like an oomph noise. It was one of the voices putting his shoulder to the door. And he went, oomph. And she went, no, no, leave me alone. No, drop dead, drop dead. So there was one more oomph and they were in. There was this great splintering of wood. There sounded this terrible struggle going on. No shouts or squeals or anything like that. Just these kind of uh, uh, grunts of exertion. And the sound of the toothbrush man clattering around the bar. And then it just went quiet. I think they must have, uh, they must have shot a tranquilizer dart into her flank, you know. And, <laughs> I heard one of the voices say, he said, right, we'll take this end. You take the, I don't think he said hind legs, but that's the way I remember it. That's the way I remember it. They lifted her up and they heaved her bodily down the stairs, dislodging my grandfather's watercolours of the Lake District as they went. And I, I tiptoed over to my bedroom window and pulled back the curtain and looked down and I saw them, actually saw them manhandling her lifeless form into the back of a white cortina. The car door closed, the car backed out into the road, drove off into the distance, and I didn't see her again for about five years. As far as I was concerned, it was the end of an unpleasant chapter. And I went over to the bedroom door, you see, my bedroom door, and I opened the door, and I, as soon as I did, I was hit by this wall of silence. So the air was heavy with silence. It was exactly as if the house had been exorcised of an evil spirit. That's what it was like. And I went down the stairs and into the breakfast room, and there, sitting at the breakfast table, exactly where my mother had sat and thrown a fork at me ten years earlier, was my father, looking stunned. Didn't even say, why aren't you at school? He just said, did you hear all that? And I said, yes. <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> it's all over. And he said, yes. It's all over. Shall we have a drink? But of course, it wasn't all over, and it's not all over. Even now, today, it's not over. Because, you see, I've had to try and rebuild some kind of a relationship with this woman. I've had to force myself to love her. She's still my mother, and it wasn't her fault. All those things she did. She was ill, you see, I didn't know that then. But I know it now. You see, you can never completely turn your back on your mother, however hard you try. Because your mother's the first person to teach you the meaning of love. Unconditional love, the only kind that really matters. You can't turn your back on that. So I don't argue with her anymore, you see, when she tells me about some conversation she's been having with Fergie, you know, <laughs> or Richard and Judy, or whoever. Those conversations are as real to her as this conversation I'm having with you now. She lives alone in a town called Seaham, County Durham. Up north, you know, with a cat. She's got a little cat called Dusky. And she says, Dusky, 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 come on, come on. And she says, she says, he's never forgiven me, you know, have you? He says, he's never forgiven me for chopping his balls off. <laughs> I didn't do it, silly. The vet did it. But I took him to see the vet in the car. And he says, you'll never forgive me for that, will you? And he says, he doesn't like the bottom thing. I said, the bottom thing? So we all about the bottom thing. What, what's the bottom thing? She said, you know, he doesn't like being fucked up the arse by the other cats. <laughs> I said, mother! I said, I beg your pardon. I said, are you sure about that? She said, don't, she said, don't call me mother. It makes me feel old. Call me mum, if you don't mind. Yes, of course I'm sure. He told me, didn't you? He said, he said that when there's no women cats around, the men cats do it to each other at the bottom, don't they? And you don't like it, do you? No, he doesn't like it, no. <laughs> I'll tell you something. She's probably right. <laughs> Go on, she's, probably, she's probably right. She probably is. Go on, get off. I'll have to ask David Attenborough next time I see him. He'll know, won't he? <laughs> yes, he knows these things, doesn't he? 
And I'll tell you something else for nothing as well. My mother is the only person I know in the world who would share a piece of information like that with me. God bless her. God bless her. What are you playing at? What are you playing at? I've been filling in for you for the last half hour. Eh? Well, get on with it then, God's sake. That's it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it, I can't go on anymore. I'm in too much pain. Oh, sweet Jesus, would you look askance if I tried to leave this stinking world? This body that torments me with pain. Oh, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. Yes, I'm gonna do it. I've had enough, I'm gonna do it. Wait for me, sweet Jesus, I'm coming. I'm co oh, bugger, I'm late for dinner. So anyway, so I said to him, no, Archie, I said to him, I said, if you think I'm going to stand here while you fiddle with your equipment, you've got another thing coming, mate. I'm a professional, you know. I arrive on time and I leave on time, I said, yes. Oh, yes, now then, uh, yes, Jeremy, you're, you sit there. No, Jeremy, you sit here, you sit here. Yes, you come around here. Jeremy, you sit there. Russell, you sit here. Russell here, Jeremy there. Martin, if you don't mind, I'll sit here. No, well, I always sit with me back to the restaurant, you see, otherwise you get all these gawpers coming over and old trough hunters and God knows what. You don't get a moment's peace. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Oh, hello, Silvano. Hello, how are you? Love to see you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Here's the menus. Here's the menus. And uh, can we have a basket of bread, please, and lots of lovely butter? And not that butter that's been in the fridge. I want room temperature butter that I can spread, please. Not that rock hard stuff. Yes, we'll look alive. Yes. Oh, yes, you have to tell him, you know. You do, you have to tell him, yes. So now I said to this producer, I said to her, I said, how dare you? I said, I'm a professional, you know. Oh, yes, I said, I arrive on time. Jack and Ori. I've told you, Jack and Ori, you know, children's stories. Load of rubbish. You know, load of rubbish. But it helps keep the wolf from the door, I suppose. And I always <coughs> like to keep my face in front of the youngsters. You see, because they're so loyal. Very loyal and sincere kind of an audience, you know. Oh, yes, oh, yes, please keep your face in front of the youngsters, you know. What? Oh, yes, I did. I did leave the five of the doctor, yes, and they weren't best pleased. And I thought, quite frankly, I don't give a shit. And I got the car to drop me off in Southampton Road so I could pop in the boots and get some cotton buds and a prescription filled. And you will never guess who I bumped into. Yeah, Russell, Russell, listen. Remember that time we went to see that awful production of An Ideal Husband at the, um, Duke of York's, yes, the Duke of York's. I do you remember we were sitting in the bar at the interval and I was pestered by that great fat queen. Remember him? Do you remember him, that great fat queen with the great, huge one, great fat queen with the little red face and the ill-fitting toupee. Remember him? <laughs> him, yes. I came flying out of boots this afternoon and went smack straight into her on the pavement outside boots. I could not believe my misfortune. No, I couldn't believe. Of course he recognised me. Oh, see, recognise when he was saying to me, he was saying, oh, you were so cruel, you were so cruel. What you said to me that time, the Duke of York's, I went home and cried my eyes out. I did after what you said to me. I said to him, my dear fellow, I said, no, I said, you must understand. I'm always being pestered by people, you know. You know, see, what you try and have a civil word for everyone, but sometimes your front slips, you know, and you let yourself down. I said, please accept my apologies, my dear fellow. Yeah. Of course, what I wanted to say was, get your great ignorant face out of it. Go on, better of it. take your wig with you. Go on, get out of it. Yes. Now, of course I didn't. Don't be silly, Oh, hello, Silvano. Yes. What? Oh, yes, right, yes. yes. Hang on, yes. Are you ready to order? Ready to order? No, they haven't even looked at their menus. They're too busy talking. Give us another minute, will you? <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, listen, is, um, is, uh, what's it, uh, Vit Vittorio? Is Vittorio in? Is he? Oh, good. We'll tell him his uncle Kenneth is here. We'd like a word with him. Would you send him out to see me, please? Send him out. Yes, send him out to see me. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh. So I said to this great queen with a wig, I said to him, I said, what's all this about you claiming that you know Maggie Smith? Remember that? He was going on about how he knew Maggie Smith. I know Maggie Smith. I said to him, I do know Maggie Smith. I said, I know Maggie Smith very well indeed. She's an old and dear friend of mine. I've known her for many, many years. And I asked her, I asked her myself, I did. I said to her, I said, Mags, I said, I said, Mags. I said, have you ever heard of this great queen, have you? Ever heard of this great fat queen with a wig, have you? Ever heard of him? Ever heard of him, have you, Mags? Ever heard of him? She said, no, Kenneth, I've never heard of him. Is that <laughs> 
She said you must be one of your friends, Helen, because he's not one of mine. I tell you. I said, no, he's not one of my friends. He said, it's one of your bloody friends. It's one of your bloody friends. She said, he's not one of my friends, Helen. I tell you, I've never heard of him. I said to her, she said, no, she said, she never heard of you, mate. And he said, no, well, she wouldn't know, because I had to change my name, you see. Yes, I had to change my name five years ago because I was caught engaged in an act of gross indecency with an Irish labourer in the gents on Kilburn High Street. And the shame, the shame nearly killed me mother. I said, why, your mother wasn't down there with you, was she? <laughs> ah! 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 Laugh! Laugh! And then he bought me own beer. Ah, dear. <laughs> No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He started crying. He did start crying in the street. He said, he said oh no, she died of a stroke three months later. We had to bury her in a pauper's grave. <laughs> Honestly, the tears, tears were flowing, they were. In the street outside Boots, Strefford. It was such a repulsive spectacle. I just turned on me, it was and fled on it. Oh, Vittorio! Vittorio, hello, my dear fellow. Hello, how are you? Come and sit down. Come and join us. Come on, put up a chair. Put up a chair. Come and have a natter. Yes, that's right. Move over, Russell. Move over. Let me sit down. Go on. Hello, Vittorio. Yes. How I love to see you. Yes. Here, listen, tell me. How did you get on with that young lady you were telling me about? Remember that young lady with a... Yes. How'd you get on? Did you take my advice? You didn't? What happened? Yeah, I told you not to bother with all that rubbish. They don't want all that nowadays, all that Latin charm, do they? All that moonlight and roses and romance, they don't want that, no. Just take her in your great hairy arms, slap her about a bit and give her what for. <laughs> give her a good scene to, you know. Look, listen, mate, your English isn't that bad, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so you didn't get your wicked way with her, you didn't. Well, if you'd have done what I said, you'd have got what you wanted, wouldn't you? You wouldn't, you wouldn't have to go home and make do with the bark clothes, would you? The Barclays, you wouldn't have to go home and have a Barclays. <laughs> What's Italian for Barclays? Banco Italiano, you wouldn't have to go home and bank oh, no. Forget it, forget it, forget it. How's your wife? Yes, and there's a boy, there's a boy. Oh, it's a little girl, isn't it? Yes, a little girl, um, yes, right, um, Gina. Gina, is that right? Yes, Gina, thank you very much, yes, yeah, I remembered. Oh, is she? Really? Oh, how lovely. Oh, no, that is nice. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. Yes. No, I don't have anything, I don't have anything on me. No, I don't carry stuff around with me. I've got a pen. I've got a pen. Do you know me? Give us a napkin. Give us a napkin. I'll sign a napkin for her. Yes, there we are. And, uh, should I bring a signed photograph in next time I'm here? There we are. Oh, no, no, no. It's no trouble at all. No. Anything for you, Victoria. Of course. Yes. So, what have we what what got for us tonight? What's the special? Meatballs. Oh, meatballs. <laughs> meatballs. Oh, lovely meatballs. Lovely. Mm, are they your own? <laughs> I mean, did you make them yourself? I'll do the jokes around here and make you don't mind. Thank you. Maybe their own hands, are they? Maybe their own hands. Oh, lovely. Well, we'll certainly give those some thought. Well, yes. Certainly give that. Oh, look at her drooling. You silly old slut, Jeremy. Put your, put your eyes back in there. Ain't that on stalks they are? Really dreadful. Put yourself together. Dreadful. Listen, I'll speak to you in a minute. Listen, Vittorio, I think you better go back to the kitchen. Go on. Get back to the kitchen before something happens to you. You're not safe around here with this one. Yes. Oh, and by the way, Vittorio, come and see me later. And um, we'll have a little drink here. Yes, just the two of us. A nice liqueur. Yes, a nice liqueur. Yes, that'd be lovely. Yeah, lovely. See you later then. See you later. Bye. Kiss. Bye. Lovely boy, isn't he? Yes, charming manners for an Italian, don't you think? <laughs> you were disgusting, Jeremy. You see, well, I saw you ogling him, undressing him with an eyes. I saw you. It's a good thing you were sitting down. You just shown yourself up. <laughs> yes. Anyway, let's place an order, shall we? Where's Silvano? Silvano! Where is he? Silvano! He's never around when you need him, is he? Silvano! 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 What? Oh, don't, there you are. Don't sneak up on me like that. Don't really. If you give me a heart attack, dreadful. Don't sneak around like that. Here, here, by the way, I wish to draw your attention to a party of Americans at the table over there who are ruining our evening with their deafening racket. Them. <laughs> yes, them. Them. That lot over there. Them over there. He's the worst. The great fat one with the crew cut. Go and tell him to shut up. Go on. 
Yeah, that's your job, isn't it? Go on, don't tell them to shut up. Well, you can sit, don't they? I'm going to make a sit, Martin. Jeremy, come over here like they own the bloody place. You get sick to death of them, don't you? Go on, get back to Albuquerque or wherever you're from. Go on, back her off. Yes, bloody moon. Why do the wrong people travel, travel, travel when the right people stay back home? What could... That's right, yes, no coward. No coward, yes. You know the middle bit? The bit in the middle? Just... I know it, I know it, I'll see it, I'll see it. He goes, they will take a train or an aeroplane for an hour on the Costa Brava and see Pompeii on the only day that is up to its art in Molten Lava. <laughs> and millions of tourists are churning up the gravel while they gaze at St. Peter's Dome. But why, oh, why do the wrong people travel and the right people stay back home and mind their business? And when the right people stay back home and eat hot donuts when the right people stay back home, I'm really asking why the right people stay what are you telling me to shush for? <laughs> How dare you shush me, Raffle? Listen, if you want to shush someone, go and shush them over there. They're the ones making all the bloody noise. <laughs> Shut your mouth! How do yourself think of this table? <laughs> Don't you dare shush me again. <laughs> now, come on. Let's make an order, quickly. Silvano, don't keep wandering off. Go on strike or something. Try and make an order here. Who's having a sasha? Well, the uh, minister is uh, very good, I believe. Minister oh, no, it's not. No, no, listen, listen. Save time. Bring them three plates of antipasto for them. Yes. Anything. Anything. Surprise them. Yes, they like to be surprised. Yes. They, oh, no, I wouldn't touch that rubbish. You must be joking. With my bum the way it is at the moment. Oh, <laughs> no, the bum's there, you know, at the moment. I'm going to stick to my mains. I'm going to stick to my mains. What are you your mains, right? <laughs> Tagliatelle, uh, tagliatelle a la crema, please. Mind you, you need something with it. You need to order a side dish or something. Well, it's just spaghetti with the white sauce, that's all it is. There's no, <coughs> it's just plain, they're very plain. There's no meat, no vegetables, nothing. You need to order a side. <coughs> all right, but don't say I didn't warn you. What are you having? Do you know what I mean? What are you having? Aubergine parmesan. Aubergine parmesan, yeah. Yes. Aubergine Parmesan. Yeah. Oh, it sounds lovely, doesn't it? Aubergine! Aubergine Parmesan. Yeah. Aubergine. Uh, uh, mind you, mind you, mind, not too much cheese. Oh, no, no. Well, that's what gives you the art burn. Oh, yes, I get dreadful art burn. I do too much cheese. Dreadful, yes. So, not too much cheese on uh, the Aubergine Parmesan. Yeah. I should have view. Yes, I should have veal escalope with uh, sautéed spuds and uh, nice and crunchy, please. Nice and crunchy, spuds, crunchy. Yes, thank you. And I should have a salad with no cucumber, no tomato, and no raw onion, if you don't mind. What are you having, Martin? Come on, you've had long enough. What do you want? What can I have? Look. You're just going to get bolognese, right? Stag bowl. Stag bowl, that do you, stag bowl. Stag bowl, so I think it's stag bowl. Right, stag bowl for him. Stag bowl. Spaghetti bolognese for him. Yes. Narrow then, bring. Yeah, so don't keep on it off. Listen, bring all the courses together, Silvana, all the, the main courses and the hors d'oeuvres. Bring them all at the same time, because I'm in a hurry. And uh, we're a bottle of. Um, uh, you're the expert, Jimmy. A bottle of. Um, Get two bottles of Chianti Rufino and a basket of bread. I asked him for a bit about half an hour ago, didn't I? Well, go and get it then. Never mind standing there scratching your great Italian ass. Go and get it. Go oh. on. Really, this is appalling. It's dreadful. It really is dreadful. I didn't like coming out with it, don't you know? What? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, that's a very good question, Martin. Yes. Yes, I did. I knew Noel Coward very well indeed, didn't I? Yes, he was an old friend of mine. Yes, he used to come and knock on me dressing room door, you know, and uh, he'd come in, and uh, we'd uh, we'd discuss our bums, uh, our bums, We're, our bums. Yes, well, he was a fellow sufferer, wasn't he? Oh, yes, he was a fellow sufferer. He used to say to me, he used to say, "My dear boy, I'm an absolute martyr to the hemorrhoidals, you know, the hemorrhoidals, dear boy. Yes, hemorrhoidals, the farmer child. I can't shift." The farmer Giles for love or money. I've tried everything, you know, tried everything, and I can't. I'm stuck with them. Yes, stuck with the farmer Giles. Yes, stuck with the farmer Giles. Yes. And of course, it was Howard who sent me to my specialist, wasn't it? Mr. Mayhew, my proctologist. Howard referred me to him, you see. Oh, yes, he did. He said to me, he said, My dear boy, 
You really ought to go and see Mr. Mayhew, you know. All the stars go and see him. He has peered up the arseholes of a veritable who's who. <laughs> that is it, yes. A veritable, veritable who's who of show business glitterati. Yes. Yes, now she'll never forget the first time Mr. Mayhew examined mine. First time he examined mine, he took one look and he said, My dear Bobber. He said, My dear fellow. He said, What's been going on down here? He said, Looks like you've been through the wars. I've never seen such a mess. He said, It looks like you've been through the battlefield of the Somme. A great boy, he said, all these scars and trenches. What's been going on? I said to him, I said, well, I've had all the operations, you know, Miss Mayhew. I said, I've had, I've had them all. I've had the fistula. I've had the fistula. I've had the inflamed colon. I've had the spastic rectum. I've had the pharma giles. I said, I said, I've, polyps. Get polyps? Yes. I said, I've had more barium meals. You know, but not dinners, I said. <laughs> Listen, if I'm boring you two, I can always go and sit at another table. Well, stop goggling into each other's eyes in that disgusting fashion. Yes, you were. I saw you. If you want to have it off, go and do it at another table. Go on, don't do it in my time. And keep your ears open, you might learn something. So come on, Martin. Now's your chance. Come on. How's this, um, how's this great money-making venture of yours going? What's what I was told? You were going to make a fortune once you found your feet. <coughs> All right, well, just tell me about it. Don't give me a great load of self-justification. Just tell me how it's going. Go on. Yes. Yes. Mmm. Really? Mmm. Must have been very really amusing. Must have been very amusing, I said. Mmm. Yes. Really? Yeah, fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Really, yes. Oh, it's the food! It's the food! Oh, it comes the food! Oh, excuse me, Martin, the food's here! The food's here! We'll come straight back to you, I promise you we will. We will. The, the food's here, excuse me, excuse me. What's this? What's this? What's this? Roasted red peppers. Roasted red peppers in olive oil. Oh, lovely. So what's this? Olives. Mixed olive salad. Mixed olive salad. Lovely. And artichokes. Is it gr grilled artichoke hearts in gut. Oh, smell the garlic on that. Have a whiff of the garlic. Smell the garlic on that. Have a whiff of the garlic. Oh, yes. Too much. Yes. On the grill. On the grill. Thank you very much. Yes. Lovely. It's aubergine. Parmesan. You're here. Thank God for him. Thank you for him. And uh, tag me a tell you, and I'll cream off for our friend here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Now, I told you, didn't I? I said it's the spaghetti with the white sauce, didn't I? I told you, you see, you need something on it. You need to spruce it up a bit. Here you are. No, wait, no, wait, listen. Have some roasted red peppers on it. There we are. Yes, you see, a bit of colour, which you need. Lovely, you see. There's a few of those. And uh, have an artichoke. Go on, have a choke. Have a choke. <laughs> Live dangerously. Have a choke. There we are. Lovely. And an olive. Go on, have a little olive. Here we are. Have an olive. You do. You love them. You love them. Go on. Go on. Have an olive. There we are. Now then. Stir it all in. Stir it all in. It's like a work of art now, isn't it? You see? Beautiful. See, you should have asked me in the first place, shouldn't you? Martin, carry on with the story, please. We're all riveted. Come on. <laughs> Jeremy, pour the wine, would you please? Pour the wine. Oh, no, 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 Martin. Let Jeremy pour the wine. Let him do it, because he's the expert, you see. Oh, yes, he's a, he's a dab hand at the pouring, aren't you? Oh, yes, dab hand at the pouring. Yes, he is. You know why, don't you? Because he's got the wrist action. <laughs> You'll find that out later when he's got the wrist action, all right. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Mm. Yeah, it's a very good choice. Lovely. Excellent. Yeah, it's very nice. uh, excuse me, Martin. Can I, uh, can I just uh, give you a word of advice from an old pro? Listen, never begin any anecdote, however trivial, unless you have a clear idea of where you're going to end up. You see? <laughs> no, no, you, you, you must have a tagline. You see, just always have a tagline in mind. You see, otherwise you end up dribbling on. You know, ad infinitum. I'm just boring the pants off everyone. You see. I'm just telling him, that's all. Just give him a word of advice. It's a word of advice. You say, I, say I told you. Say I told you, yes, I'm an old pro, yes. Say I told you. By the way, do you want to hear some good news? Oh, I've got some marvellous news. Do you want to hear me news? Listen, I haven't had a twinge. No, I haven't had a twinge. Look how much I've drunk already. It's a remarkable I had a dreadful night with the bum. Oh, the bum was agony last night. You know, I couldn't get to sleep because of pain. You know, it was dreadful. So there I was, 
You see, I was sitting there on the pan, three o'clock in the morning, having, having a fag I was. I was sitting there and it all started. Oh, the wind <laughs> was blowing, it was. The wind was blowing. Yes, you've never heard such atrocious farting. It was dreadful. <laughs> dreadful it was, I was surprised the neighbours didn't pay me no really. Um, yes, I was screaming in agony, I was, and that was just the beginning. That was just the beginning, you uh, see, Martin, because then came the, uh, the, the, the diarrhea, yeah. you know, the, the explosive diarrhea. <laughs> oh, I, I could have pebbled that to the side of the house with that lot of apple. Yes, dreadful it was, never heard it so bad, dreadful it was. Oh, of course, I was, I'm a fool to myself, because I've mints on toast for me tea, you see. That's what it was, you see, I'm a fool to myself. My favourite, yes, never again. Oh, no, never again. Never again! Never again will I have mince on toast for my tea! No! Never! Never again will I have mince on toast for my tea! No! Never! Never! Mm. Anyway, that's your food. Yes? That's your food. That's your lobe. That's your lobe. That's your bolognese. What's the matter? We lost your appetite? Oh, what a pity. He said he was angry when he came in as well, didn't he? Oh, what a pity. Oh, no, no. No, no, thank you. No, no. I won't try it. No. No, no, thank you. It would be in one end and out of the other if I tried it, wouldn't it? Yes. Go on, eat it up. It looks delicious. Oh, go on, eat it up, doesn't it? Great lumps of meat floating around in lovely brown sauce. Yes. <laughs> it looks lovely. Go on, get it down your neck. That's the way. No, I never sign autographs when I'm trying to eat a meal with friends. Go away. I don't care if you haven't got Sid James's. Bugger off. <laughs> Sod off. Do you know? I've got Sid James's signature. Said, I've got Sid James's signature. I said, you don't give a shit. We've got Sid James's bloody signature. I said, I said, go on, see old card. Don't come to me with the Sid James. That clapped out old windbag. I said, go on, sir. I don't care. If I don't care. I've got Adolf Hitler's bloody signature. I said, go on. You know, you silly cow. I said, but don't give me a lecture, Jeremy. How would you like them to me when you have these great cretins coming up to you, pouring at you, asking for an autograph? You get sick to, sick to death of it. You really do. You know, I heard this uh, very amusing story the other day about James Joyce. A lovely story about James Joyce. Apparently he was walking down O'Connell Street in Dublin, you see, and this great nit came up to him and she said, may I kiss the hand that wrote Ulysses? And he said, no, it's done a lot of other things as well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, marvellous reply, wasn't it? Now I'm all right, I've just got a twinge, that's all. Just a little twinge, it's nothing. Don't worry about me, go on, eat your food. Eat your food. I'm, I'm just going to have a quick bowel evacuation. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> Here, hold the fork, would you? Hold the fork. Oh, yeah. Now I'll be back in a minute. Oh, God help us. Oh, oh, oh God help us. Oh, oh. It's a dis... It's a disgrace! Oh. Here. Here, come over here. Silvano, come here. Have you seen the state of those lads? Go on, have a look. Come on, it's all over the floor. Yes, it's all over the floor. There's gob in the sink, the snot on the mirrors, there's pubes everywhere. It's oh. disgusting, it is. Revolting. Make sure to be sticky, does. Go on, clean it up. Go on. Make sure to be. Have you seen the state of those lads? Have you seen the state of those lads? Oh, never seen it. Grateful. Make sure to be. If it does. Of course, you know what it is. You know who the culprits are for that one, don't you? Those bloody Americans. That's what we're <laughs> Coming over here doing the same to our lads as they did to Vietnam. <laughs> No, I'm all right. I've just had a very long day, that's all. I went to, went to this fucking poetry recital this morning. I should never have gone. Because there was wine, wasn't there? Oh, yes. Of course, I had some, didn't I? Yes, I did that bawling and shouting in the street. I was bawling and shouting, making a pathetic exhibition of myself. Yes, I'll never learn, you know. Oh, no, I'll never learn. That's the only thing I have learned, that I'll never learn. <laughs> I'll tell that story about T.S. Eliot. And you know what I want about T.S. Eliot when he gets in the back of the cab? Oh, lovely story. He gets in the back of his cab, you see, and the cab driver looks at him in the driving room and he says to him, Tear salute, isn't it? Tear salute? Yes, I thought so. I've had them all in my cab, mate. Oh, I've had them all in my cab. Who do you think I had in my cab last week, then, eh? Bertrand Russell, the greatest philosopher in the Western world, so they say. Yeah, well, I. Now I'm all right. Greatest philosopher in the Western world. So I say to him, I said to him, I said, Bert, I said, Bert, what's it all about, mate? I thought you said you'd never heard it. When have you heard me tell it? When? On Wogan. 
Well, it's no excuse for pinching my punchline, is it? Thank you very much. I'm a seasoned raconteur, mate. You should have more respect. Really. I knew I should, knew I should never have come out tonight. You know I don't like meeting new people. I shouldn't even consider eating that dis disgusting Italian muck either. Revolting. Get it away from me. Horrible. Rotten veal. I hope you'll spare a thought for me when I'm writhing my bed of pain tonight. I mean, what you two will be doing as well. Oh, shut up. I'm not in a mood. I'm going to serve that red wine. It's supposed to be good for a sore stomach, isn't it? Isn't it? Oh, oh my word, I do, I do feel queer. Is that supposed to be funny, young man? Is that supposed to be funny? Are you setting me up? Are you setting me up? Well, that's what it sounded like to me. It sounded as if you were setting me up. Well, it sounded that way to me. I, I, I mean, I, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I'm wrong. But a, I see, I don't appreciate being, uh, uh, being sent up. I don't think it's funny at all, doing myself being people doing crude imitations of the way I speak. I don't think it's funny. I think it's, I think it's fucking insulting. How dare you send me up? Yes, you were. I heard you. Yeah. What are you defending you for? What are you defending you for? You didn't even send me up. Yes, see. Oh, we all stick together, don't you? Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Russell. Of course you do. Oh, yes. You all stick together, don't you? Yes, of course you do. It's, it's no being sorry. It's too late to be sorry. The damage is done now. You ruined the evening. Now you've ruined the evening now. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, see. I'm going about enough. Get off. Get off. All right. We'll just hurry up and eat your food then. Don't let's hang about. I've had enough. We'll go home. Oh, of course I'm not coming to the pictures. In my state, don't be stupid. Oh, what are you going to see? What are you going to see? <laughs> that rubbish will go near it. I don't know if these people are in these films anymore. They're American mediocrities, aren't they? Oh, yes. All you get is a lot of fucking filth and profanity. It's disgusting. Turns your stomach, you can't even go to the pictures anymore now, can you? Oh, no. They've even taken that small pleasure away from me now, haven't they? Oh. Now, I've told you before, you cannot have an autograph. Back it off and leave you alone. I've told you before. Well, whoever it was, I've told you before. Go on. Back it off. Sod off. Sod off. Go on. Leave me alone. That's it. I've had enough. I've had enough of this whole stinking ordeal. There's been money. It's been a fucking nightmare from start to finish. Thank you very much indeed. There we are. There's me money. No, no. There's me money. You pay for me. You pay for me. Oh, no. I always, I always pay me own fucking way. I always pay me own fucking way. Put you on. I listen. And for many a time I've been half in love with easeful death, called in soft names in many a musical rhyme, to take into the air my quiet breath, 
now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no Whilst thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain to thy high requiem become a sod. Oh, what the use! I hate to end it like that because I wish he hadn't done it. I wish he was still here with us because I miss him. I miss him, don't you? And I wish I'd told him how much I loved him. I never did. I never met him. I never wrote to him or anything. I could have, but I didn't realize how much I loved him until he was gone. And it was too late to tell him. But I'll tell you something. Wouldn't have made any difference to him, even if I had told him, because he, he didn't love himself. You can't accept love from other people until you love yourself. It's not an easy lesson for any of us to learn. I know that. I'll go on learning it till the day I die. Sure. So, on behalf of Kenneth and my mother, and Mr. Brindley, and everybody else in the cast, please think no evil of us. And remember, we do love you madly. Thank you. Thank you.